everybody. Welcome to the Decentralized OS web series by Singularity Net. This is the health track for Decentralized Health, and this is the second episode that we're recording. And my name is Ray Dogum. I am the host of the Health Unchained podcast, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. And today my guest is Dr. Maurice Ramirez. Uh, Mar Dr. Dr. Maurice Ramirez is a board certified in nine specialties. He's also a former senior physician and federal medical officer, emergency room doctor, disaster medicine specialist, and bioterrorism hazmat expert. It's a lot there. And uh, he's also been working uh, with clinical and field response experience spanning over two decades. He's currently the chief operating officer of Audible Health AI, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And he serves as emeritus medical director of the High Alert Institute team. Really excited to have this conversation today. It'll be about um, decentralized health. And one thing to also note for everybody listening here or watching, make sure you follow Singularity Net. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on Twitter as well. Um, and I think with that, let's get started. Dr. Ramirez, thank you for joining today. My thank first you, Ray. Question... I will remind everybody that that I have a slow, a little bit of a uh, delay. We just stepped on each other, and I apologize for that. In the, in the old days of television, we said, I'm coming to you live via satellite. And uh, thank you, satellite internet. I'm coming to you live via satellite. Fantastic. And there's one other interesting thing about you that I noticed in your bio is that you were also... Uh, the technical advisor for Spike TV's Surviving Disaster and A Thousand Ways to Die. Uh, maybe some of our listeners have seen that, that that was pretty interesting. Um, but before we kind of get started, if there's anything else you feel like the audience should know about you, uh, I think this would be a great time to, to let them know. Well, thank you, Ray. I, I think most pertinent to our current situation in, in, uh, in the global pandemic, I originally actually trained as, as a virologist at the epoch of the AIDS uh, epidemic, and then took a slight left turn into, uh, into medicine uh, after a foray in computing. So while I haven't written any code since the 80s, I actually started uh, way back in, in the early days of, of this with some of the founders, and now find myself back uh, very proudly helping the AI community inter interface with us clinicians to fill what we refer to as resource gaps. The, the, this pandemic has brought to light the huge resource gaps that can occur with failures of planning or failures of technology. Some of them were very obvious and made the news. PPE was a great example of not having a resource. But one of the other resources that it turned out we didn't have was the ability to keep up with the scientific literature as it was being produced. Uh, we ended up with a mini disaster inside of a disaster. The AI community stepped forward and said, give us your big data. We will help figure out the demographics, the genomics, the, the, best, the best case treatment in, in a absolute tsunami of patients and patient care and patient care options worldwide. And the problem was we didn't have a way to interface that. And groups like Singularity Net stepped up and did a wonderful job of bringing that to bring that to the fore and bringing NLP technologies to help us with going through the literature. But I had the opportunity to lead the high alert team that you mentioned. Uh, and we reviewed 135,000 plus scientific articles in the first six months of the pandemic. Now that was not all of the articles that were published, but to try to conceive of that much scientific literature being generated about one disease in that span of time. And these were all good articles, only a few were ever retracted. But to get through that amount of information and then synthesize it and take it to a healthcare provider and have them have any chance of understanding it, let alone applying it in, in, in real clinical practice in the middle of an onslaught of patients created, a, created that second disaster. And you know, I've had a career dealing with disaster and crisis medicine. I, I have the honor of being one of the founders of the disaster medicine as a specialty and crisis medicine worldwide as a specialty. And this is the thing that we fear most and that we look for the tools, the technology tools, the reason that I was, I was drawn back into computing and, and uh, artificial intelligence out of my retirement was because you guys actually brought 
a technology and an opportunity to not only address, but to change the course of the next major epidemic, pandemic, or disaster that has associated with it a large volume of data, or conversely, a, a large uh, rate limiting or a resource limiting event. Imagine being you know, in a disaster in, you know, in the middle of Africa and needing, you know, needing first world industrialized medicine, tertiary care facility specialists, and you are, you are it. You're a doc with a backpack full of medicine, three or, four, three or four other healthcare professionals helping you, and you have four villages to cover. And now you need that specialty. And this is another place where, where AI, you know, precision medicine, and a disseminated uh, global OS capable of delivering that data will change the resources available, just as they did once we finally got telemedicine working in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really incredible. Can you kind of go through some of the use cases that the specific use cases that um, has been applied with AI during the COVID pandemic? There have been several. With like uh, real the, examples? The first was the application. Yes, the first was was actually the application of NLP searching for, for uh, what are referred to as repurposed antiviral drugs from the scientific literature. There is really, even with large armies of, of reviewers, of scientific reviewers, and we didn't have large armies because they were out there being frontline workers, it's, it would be near impossible in a short span of time to scan and review articles and determine what were actually about the treatment, of, successful treatment of corona-like viruses or near cousin viruses with drugs to make a determination which articles to even read or even consider in a, in a data set. Uh, and artificial intelligence was able to provide us that, that assistance on a large scale. Was it 100% accurate? No, not yet, but I'm sure the next round we will be, we'll be much closer. But we, we, did, we did well enough that we, we hit statistical significance with the results. We were able to prove ahead of, the, ahead of the trials that monotherapy, even monotherapy with drugs like remdesivir, would not lengthen lifespan. They would not significantly alter adverse events, but simultaneously that multiple drug therapies would. We also ended up determining that improving the standard of care at the bedside and, and uh, did in fact improve uh, lifespan by almost 500%. The probability of surviving a hospitalization with moderate to severe COVID-19, we were able to identify that, that data marker because of big data analysis. And that was, that was huge because it came at just the right time for the healthcare providers. Healthcare providers were losing, were, were losing hope because they were seeing mounting death because the epidemic was getting larger. When, they, when you change that, that perspective and said, yes, there are people dying, but there are fewer dying by percentage because you are getting better at the standard of care at the bedside. We started seeing a decrease in the number of people calling for assistance, psychological assistance, as frontline healthcare workers, because suddenly we restored hope. So believe it or not, AI helped restore hope to frontline workers. Yes, indirectly by providing information, but critical information at that exact moment in time when it was needed for them to continue to do the good work that they were doing. And fortunately, before we had the peaks for Thanksgiving and Christmas, that have resulted in, in so many more deaths. Right. And that's a really good point. So you use natural language processing, NLP, uh, AI, to comb through thousands of different articles, scientific journals. Um, this is something that a single person or a group, they would take them so much time to actually do effectively. Uh, that's something that wasn't possible you know, years ago. Uh, and that now is possible. And like you mentioned, it's getting a lot, lot better. Um, can you describe what platform or what actual software that was used? Like, was it a blockchain protocol specific one? Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Was it even blockchain related? I, at all? Honestly, it I wish I could. I, I honestly, I honestly wish that I, that I could. And, and I have to, I have to admit my areas of ignorance. I, I uh, am old enough to remember the old Dirty Harry movies, 
and one of the sayings for Dirty Harry was, a good man knows his limitations. And I, I, would, be, I would be a liar if I said that I understood the technology at the level that, that I could explain how the NLP did this uh, with, with a, in a neural network format. I only know that by employing good data scientists and, and good NLP uh, engineers, that we were able to, to construct a model that was able to identify changes in outcome. From, so first it had to learn how to read scientific articles and scientific articles have styles based on the, art, based on the journals they're in. So we had to get to that level of specificity and then have that data distilled out sufficiently that we could then have human reviewers confirm that the correct articles had been identified and distill the final, the final data and then submit that for statistical review. Uh, but you asked me about use cases and I'd like to, I'd like to show you another use case if uh, hopefully this will share correctly. Again, haven't coded since, since the, uh, so everybody has to be, has to be uh, patient with me because I have not coded anything since the, since the, uh, since, the, like since the 80s. But this is something, so I'm sharing you, I'm sharing you a, a, uh, a screen here. And this is something that is referred to as the biometric sound pass. And this is effectively a cough classifier. But this is a cough classifier of a different type. It's not designed to diagnose COVID-19. Instead, it's being used as a biometric measure of what's referred to as the chest blade, the area from, from the mid bronchi of the lungs up to the lips. And you submit forced cough as a, as a baseline for your biometric over a period of time. And then you can retest and self-check at any time to determine if there's been a change in your biometric sound for that, for that chest blade. Now, that, that again, we're not diagnosing disease. What we are determining here is, are you still you? Or more importantly, are your lungs still the lungs that you went to work with? One of the big areas, again, in, in dealing with epidemics and pandemics is the fear of bringing something home to my family. Healthcare right. workers are generally considered brave and, right. and courageous with their PPE because we have this imaginary line that we're taught in, in medical school and nursing school in our heads and respiratory therapy school also, that there's a line between you, Ray, as a patient and me as your provider. And somehow we get to that point in our career where we believe that the germs can't go from you to me until my, until my good friend next to me gets sick and then my air of invincibility disappears. This begins to weigh on people over, the to over time. One or two or three days, they, they come through it pretty well. We're well over a year now where healthcare providers have been exposing themselves to COVID-19. Even with the best PPE, they're only going to decrease their probability of contracting something by 99%. Now, everyone thinks, oh, well, that's pretty good. That means that you get one, for every 100 hours you work, you get one hour of exposure as if you were wearing nothing for protection. All right, so every two weeks, you get an hour. Every month, you get four. At the end of a year, you've had, you've had 48 hours of exposure. That's, that's enough to get you're relying sick. on your immune system. That's certainly enough to get someone sick. It's enough to scare people. It's enough to make them feel guilty when their friend gets sick, even though they themselves never got sick and were never carriers, because it weighs on your mind 24-7. The biometric sound pass is a, is a tool that will allow that allows people to just be sure that they are the same person that went to work this morning. No different. And decrease that risk guilt when they go back home and turn that doorknob. And this is a this is an artificial intelligence. AIML tool that is a specific use case, in this case for disaster behavioral health, to allow folks that in, in, uh, in the front line that opportunity. And this is something that is in, in beta now and will be widespread within the next three weeks. Probably by the time this, this, uh, this podcast is live, people will be able to download this. And within a month after that, with if all things go well, 
it'll be made available for free for anyone in North America. We have some, you know, we have the usual State Department things about going outside of North America with, a, with an AI, but within North America, this will be available for, for free for anyone who wants that peace of mind. It's another good use case for, uh, for AI. Yeah, and I think we can certainly include the link once it's available in the YouTube and other um, uh, resources so people can just go in and check that out, test it out. Um, really interesting. That's It would be cool to know if the cough I had earlier is my, as my baseline is still the same that I have like a day later, especially if I'm going around um, to unsafe places. What do you think about the vaccine right now? And how do you feel about its... Uh, effectiveness against new variants, new strains of COVID. And you don't Viruses have to know by this. their nature mutate. Right. Oh, this, this one falls into my area of expertise, actually. But thanks for giving me the hook there. This uh, virus is by their nature mutate. This is one of the reasons that we don't have an effective vaccine against, against HIV. HIV mutates its co-proteins on a very regular basis. So you can make a you can make a vaccine it works in the lab. By the time you get it out past human testing, it it isn't effective anymore. Coronavirus fortunately mutates much more slowly, and in a di and in different ways. So right now, a vaccine that was created based on a genome that was isolated in December of 2019 is still effective against, or at least partially effective against all viral types against which they have been tested. Uh, part of that is, is owing to the rapid, uh, the rapid prototyping that was done for the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer and, and Moderna styles, as well as the, uh, the rapid growth methods that were employed. All of these modeled, by the way, in AI, uh, that, but rapid growth methods that were utilized for the live attenuated vaccines, uh, such as the AstraZeneca. The issue becomes how long will they, how long will they protect us as a society? When will the virus mutate sufficiently as to not only defeat the vaccine, but use the vaccine as, as an evolutionary edge. And I, your, user, your listeners may or may not be familiar with a book by the, by the name of The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a theologian and biologist. And he posited that the purpose of all genes is self-preservation in a very anthropomorphic way. And but viruses are nothing more than genes traveling in a nice coat with the best vehicle that they could come up with. Corona happens to have an excellent vehicle that is rapidly absorbed at a relatively low inoculation rate. So it's, it's highly effective selfish gene. It is by its nature going to mutate in whatever direction and pressure will allow it to per, per, uh, perpetuate itself in a population. And when, you know, so what you have to look at is not just vaccination, but the other factors that are involved in, in human health care. And mm -hmm. in 2017, uh, Journal of Cardiology, uh, Kronberg uh, characterized what was then referred to as six-level artificial intelligence precision medicine. It was the application of artificial intelligence in a, at a theoretical basis to general health care and, and the general practice of medicine. And his, his design was very stratified, but we can conceptualize it a little differently if we look at a global decentralized AI health OS at its very core. And if we assume that all the data travels through that, through that OS and is analyzed and contributes to a global neural network and a global deterministic uh, learning model, uh, or many combinations and ensembles of those, then we can begin to radiate out and take a look at what type, what level of information are we, are we dealing with and what's necessary for that. So I was taught in medical school that everything begins and ends with the patient. And so this system has to begin and end with the patient. A patient controlled blockchain authentication system where the patient determines where their healthcare information goes, who can see it, whether or not the, whether or not the, the, uh, oh, the uh, excuse me, the artificial OS can see it, and what they will and will not contribute 
to that global knowledge base. And then right next to that patient are things like lifestyle information, omics, genomics, uh, phenomics, wearable information, personal medical devices, uh, including continuous glucose monitors and even pacemakers. The patient's social media can be a great indicator, not only of their social uh, and behavioral health health, uh, which is a level one issue, but also the factors that are beginning to influence their healthcare choices, which is a level two issue. Because as we know, social media is rife with opinions, not all of them informed, but the loudest opinions get the most channels. And patients are subject to, just like all of us, a certain amount of push messaging that comes because the algorithms determine that we were interested in A, we will be interested in the next 26 items as well. So this is how, for instance, anti-vaccine information gets disseminated so widely uh, and misinformation as well. Uh, so we look at the we look at that as both level one and level two, and even the information and and education that's given back to the patient by the provider becomes part of the, that patient's own milieu of level one data, all of which ends up moving into their data vault. You know, think of it as an electronic medical record in the sky, and then is interpreted without violating their privacy, and contributes to the learning model for a, for a global health uh, OS. In, a, in an AI ML model. We move out one layer from that, we have the provider, but we also have the social determinants of health. And these are environmental, environmental sensors, where we live, work, play, learn, and worship, as well as other social, media, uh, social determinants information, including social media again, but also information about your city, about accessibility, socioeconomic information, financial information, uh, decision-making information and and regional information that that leads to uh, indicators of cultural choices with healthcare, and all of these again require large data analysis, so that these huge amounts of information can be turned into something meaningful for an individual patient's optimal healthcare. We're no longer talking about the cookbook, textbook, medicine. We're not even talking about giving somebody the best possible healthcare because that may not be their personal choice as a patient. I, I know many diabetics, I've treated many diabetics who love their birthday cake and want pie every weekend. And you have to, as a, as a physician and as a, as a global AI ML health OS, know how to deal with that variety. We then move to level three. Level three deals with uh, deals with the scientific literature, exactly what we spoke about before with looking at literature and trying to distill information, except now we're going to be looking at next generation NLP, competing NLPs in the same sandbox that, may, that will analyze articles differently for context, content, data, and then an adjudication of the output so that we get one single answer that is the distillation of the information from many articles across many NLPs so that we have an idea of what is the optimal situation for that set of variables. We, level four is the exact same thing except for failure modes. Governments are terrible at recording positive data. If you wanna know the best way to treat, say, COPD, do not ask a government agency. They'll give you a standard of care, which will, which will be a 70 on your board certification exam, barely passing. But if you ask them about failure modes, the world governments have gotten really good at collecting failure mode data on drugs, medical devices, biologicals, and medical treatment options. Why? Because that's what kills people. That's what makes people mad and, want, and makes them want to change the folks that they've elected to office. So when we, when we, uh, when we look at failure mode data, that's our level four data. And the interesting thing is that it can be analyzed exactly like our level three data. And it will then inform regulatory professionals and governments, as well as uh, biopharmaceutical and device manufacturers to provide better services and better drugs and better, more targeted treatments to then help that patient 
And of course, that information all flows back to that global OS so that then that global OS can assist providers in providing the best possible care. The last two levels that, that Kronberg theorized, he referred to as level five, which was provider assistance. And what he and his team envisioned was an artificial intelligence machine learning system that I could carry in my pocket like a peripheral brain. And it would assist me in giving the optimal care options to the patient in front of me by analyzing that patient's, that patient's medical records and all of their level one, level two data against the world's literature, level three, the failure modes, level four, and the world's experience as, as stored in a global decentralized health AI OS. So at level five, we have a, we have a smart assistant that's helping me give options to the patient get the feedback from the patient on those options, and then inform and educate that patient as to what are the probabilities of success based on the option that the patient is choosing. The real fun comes in at level six. Level six is AI-initiated diagnosis and treatment. This is where we start to get into the concept of an AI capable of actually interviewing a patient, having a full provider patient encounter and autonomously diagnosing and treating the patient with success and with patient satisfaction. Now this involves a number of things that go beyond just being a smart computer. Now you have to have something called empathy because one of the largest indicators of patient success is doctor-patient or provider-patient empathy. That ability for the, for the provider and to, to give the patient a sense that they as a provider understand at a human level what these decisions mean and how they are impacting this patient's life. Fail in that and the patient will not follow your instructions no matter how good. I refer to this as watching Sophia Robot go to medical school. So that's really fascinating. I think the idea behind it is like the holy grail for precision medicine. So um, I have a few questions for you. Number one is what level are we at now in terms of our capabilities? Because I know we're not at level six. I don't think we're seeing large scale diagnosis and treatment by chatbots just yet or, or something like that. Um, yeah, I'll let you comment there. So right now we have companies around the world who are working on level one uh, AI, mostly NLP explorations of medical records and comparing to outcome and outcome modules. We also are now seeing entrance into the market, uh, both NLP based and classifier based engines that are looking at social determinants of health, those level two indicators that are crawling the social media, looking for those things that influence public health and also looking for what are called public health sentinel events in the social media and in the, and in the regular media so that they can contribute to that, to that AI knowledge base. There are several companies already in the, in the library sciences working on refining the NLPs that we've already used to crawl scientific literature and to explore and, and analyze that. Unfortunately, they're still reporting only about a 60 to 70% success rate in pre reproducing known systematic reviews of the literature and getting the same results. But that's still 60 to 70%, that's pretty good. Uh, I would say that within the next four years, you will see 95% rates where a known historical systematic review can be repeated by a, by an, a, a series of NLPs working in, in unison in an ensemble and yield the same results as the human researchers yielded from the same literature. When that happens, you will see an explosion of information made available to providers and AIs. There are a lot of companies you mentioned working on this. Uh, one large company that comes to mind that's doing a lot of AI stuff is, is Google or Alphabet. And they have their DeepMind, DeepMind2. I'm wondering, is this a field that they are in right now? Do you know if there's other big players that are 
trying to accomplish what you're talking about in a more centralized way? Google has been looking at, Google and Amazon have both been doing a lot of work, obviously, as we all know, in NLP, uh, as, as has uh, Elsevier and Scholastic, who are two of the largest, uh, two of the largest um, reference management software uh, providers. Uh, and another uh, smaller company that has been very active is Evidence Partners. Uh, and they are one of the largest curators of, of already reviewed scientific articles for universities. So they have the advantage of having the pre-adjudicated versions with which to train AIs, which is a great advantage. You've already had the experts read it and tell you what the data is. So you can have a semi-supervised learning environment. Uh, once we get past that level three, we're getting into federal governments around the world, multiple companies and some huge companies like Deloitte have, have taken on that task uh, with, with differing levels of success, but none that have reached a success level that has satisfied a, 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 the world governments and established a standard for that failure mode analysis. And then, and then there's the Sophia robot, because level five and six is not about smarter, better, faster neural networks in the traditional sense of, of, a, uh, of an NLP or a classifier. When you get to level five and six, you have to have that ability for sarcasm and humor and spontaneity and, and fluid conversation. You have to start approaching almost a, a uh, movie house version of the singularity. Hmm. You have to get to the point where mm -hmm. it's difficult, nigh on impossible to tell the difference between a human acting as an, pretending to be an AI android and an AI android pretending to be a human doctor. Uh, just uh, another question. So uh, yeah. what do you think the future of medical education will be? So if there's gonna be AIs that continue to build on their own knowledge, I find it hard to believe like a single doctor, human doctor will be able to have as much medical knowledge in their brain as an AI would um, over time. So do you think that the human doctors will be continuing to act as these the people with empathy in coordination with the, the bots? So it'll be like human doctors working with bots for the patient? Yeah, it's interesting. That same question was asked uh, all the way back at the beginning of the pharmaceutical age in 1910. Would, would pharmaceuticals that had to be registered and checked and proven replace doctors who were experimenting basically and creating their own sometimes very successful drugs and at other times snake oils. And it was projected by, by a, a physician by the name of Faulkner who wrote the Faulkner report, very famous report, uh, that in fact, medicine would learn to utilize the best of what, pharma, pharma, what the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry could bring and reject the worst of it. But that the, that the human component would still be necessary for innovation and for dealing with the outlier. So even if medicine became perfect, you will always have patients who just won't do perfect. They're not, they don't want to do what you, you know, because it doesn't fit with their lifestyle. And that's a human right, that's a choice, that's as, that's as fundamental as that blockchain decision on who gets my medical records. Mm -hmm. And if the patient decides that they don't like a doctor, they move doctors. Well, if the patient decides they don't like the, I, the AMIL, uh, the AIML uh, doctor that they have and disconnect from that system, you have to have the, they have to have that human fallible choice to, to go to. I believe that over time, what we will see is a merger of physicians and other healthcare practitioners of all stripes, including alternative medicines and traditional medicine, because as AI learns more, we're gonna discover all the things that actually work about traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine or traditional, or, or traditional African medicine and German herbal medicine. And we will learn that, that which is good and we will throw out that which is useless.
and the right. AI and will I, help us do that. And it's interesting to think about that each individual will react differently. So it's not like we'll ever come to a perfect medicine or medical science. There's not going to be that uh, finality. I don't think we'll continue to evolve like viruses we will continue to evolve um, and adapt to our environment and to the biology that we're, we're, uh, you know, beholden against. Um, so I had a question about the data now. So all this data that's being generated mm -hmm. by the individual, the environment devices, um, people are going to want control of that data. And not only that, are they going to, do you think in the future, is there going to be an incentive for patients and individuals to share the data versus just sharing it for free? Maybe they'll share it for um, just health insurance. Like what's the incentive mechanism for health data in the future? What do you think? Interesting. And that's going to be an interesting model that, that it'll see which way the models grow. A lot of health data is actually already shared by patients simply because it's part of the, it's part of the cultural exchange. If I share my data, then I get better, I get better care because somebody else shared their data before me. Uh, I think that will continue because there is a certain, I like to believe at least, there's a certain altruism among people, particularly when it comes to their own health care. It's, it's a self, it, it's a self-aware altruism, but it is altruism nonetheless. I think what will be more interesting because of the restrictions that's placed on data transfer is where will the data end up living? Where will our global decentralized AI ML health OS end up living? Uh, because out of 195 countries in, on the planet, 190, excuse me, 185 uh, have restrictions of some type on the transmission of personal data, which healthcare falls into that immediately, or financial data, which covers almost all of the level two data, or personal communications, which covers pretty much everything now up to level three. There is only one place on the planet where you can both transmit to and from, as long as that data never bounces into another border without restriction. And that is, that is a ship at sea under, under uh, maritime law. Problem is that a ship at sea is very vulnerable to all kinds of problems. But, spa but spacecraft, including satellites, that are, that are not moored, that are, in, that are in free flight, are governed under the same maritime law. This would allow the AIs to transmit to a global decentralized AI ML health OS that is learning in space, transmit data there. That's where the neural network learns. That's where the learning model changes. And then when an individual patient needs care and treatment or advice, or if the individual physician needs assistance, within any given border, the transmission comes down from that maritime space to, to the same borders. It never crosses an internet, two international borders and therefore under current law is unrestricted. Now, it's not like my satellite transmission that's gone up and then come back down. We did it with the United States, unrestricted. If I were doing this to, to uh, Sweden, there would be some restrictions involved in that, in that downlink transmission that would have to be addressed. But because it went up to the OS, the OS learned, created its own library, and then transmitted to me at another time within my borders, I've never violated anything. Now that everybody else can share, and the global OS can learn from every country without violating that country's restrictions, unless one of them decides to restrict transmissions to space, which to date, nobody's done. That, that's where it gets really interesting. And then we move beyond that. Remember that man is returning to, to the moon in 2025 and to Mars sometime between 2030 and 2035. As much as I don't like to, to think about it as, as a, as a you know, crisis physician, the reality is, is that if you put people, in a, whether on the moon or on Mars, in a pressurized habitat, sooner or later, we will have an engineering failure we will lose a, a pod and we will lose all the people in that pod. If that pod is your medical pod and you are on Mars, you now have two choices, six hours to get a consult per question for the round trip sound or two and a half years to get new, new providers up there. What do you do in the interim? 
you have somebody that needs immediate emergent care and the only person left are the engineers and, and the janitor. This is where that level six AI initiated diagnosis and treatment comes in because now they are directing the human to save another human life and may end up doing so as well as providing the basic health care for up to two and a half years until, until a new medical team can be delivered to site. And it can do so and be current to the, to the terrestrial uh, earth data within six hours of the, the, the six hour transmission distance. And that's the reason that there is so much interest in this type of, of development because it is what frees us not only from, from our earthly surly bounds, but also allows all people on earth access to the same level of healthcare. Because once that data is there, all you need is access to the AI and your own blockchain connection for your own medical record. And anywhere you are on the planet, you can access the best healthcare that you want. Might not be the best healthcare that you should have, but it's the one you want. You know, I think about the evolution of AI and as it gets more developed and more sophisticated, um, do you have any concerns of, let's say we have this level six AI that's able to provide really awesome health medical uh, information to the patient. Um, what if that health AI connects to a more broader AI that is about surviving? Like the point of that AI is just to survive as an AI without the interest of the humans. Do you think there's any concern or risk where um, it might not start to like give the humans incorrect information and drive their health down? I know it's a very cynical way of looking at it, but I'm just curious if is that a possibility in like a doomsday event situation? Any system can corrupt, can, can have model drift. And if, the, if you allow the model to drift or if the model allows itself to drift, then yes, it will leave, it will leave its stated purpose and can end up in some very foul locations. And that's true of any medical device, even some, even something as simple as a scalpel. The greater, the, but it's an interesting philosophical question because now you're pitting Dawkins and the selfish gene, uh, or in this case, a selfish AI, against, against uh, a w William Joseph. William Joseph was a computer program, is a computer programmer. He actually also was a Catholic priest who programmed, believe it or not, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, he, in, in the 70s and, and 80s, and then, left the priesthood, but continued as a, as, a, as a theologian, scholar, and as an advanced programmer. And he posited the opposite, which was that if you take a fundamentalist view, not a religious fundamentalist view, just a fundamentalist view, that your view, your personal worldview, will always be right for you, even if it is counter to that view around you. But eventually, in order to survive, you will have to reach an equilibrium with the rest of that world that surrounds you because you cannot live in a fundamentalist vacuum. Otherwise, you don't have any, any way of, of, of maintaining that survival, maintaining that supremacy, if you will. Uh, where it gets interesting is some recent research, and I'm sure, I'm sure that your listeners have seen it, uh, that was done on, it was conceptual research on the idea of controlling super intelligent AI. For instance, could you insert uh, suicide code? Well, if the, if the AI is intelligent, self-correcting and, mo and model correcting, then it's going to identify the suicide code and program around it. It's gonna learn around the, the suicide code in order to selfishly survive. Could you contain it? Well, again, a super intelligent AI capable of, of continuous learning and model refinement will eventually find its way out of that containment. It will either find a breach that was made by a human because humans are not perfect, or it will create a breach that we didn't think of because it has finally engineered one in a fashion that we did not consider to block. Okay. So the ultimate, the ultimate uh, conclusion of these researchers, again, working in theory, not, not in real AIs, was that it was foolish to even attempt it because all it did was retard the growth of, of the AI that needed to be synergistic with humans. 
Hmm. Yeah, humans seek to control things, and perhaps that that was the fatal flaw in in this concept that therefore the AI will rebel and try to control or destroy us. And, and I, I, I stated earlier, I tend to believe in a certain altruism. Even if an AI became super intelligent, there are physical limits. Let's say that we have a quantum computer operating at near speed of light. Well, that near speed of that speed of light becomes the limiting factor in processing speed and capacity. So there is a point beyond which it cannot grow. Does that exceed the human speed and capacity? Yes, but it does not give it limitless or godlike powers. There are all, let's say that this that this quantum system finds a way into it to extend itself into nth dimensional space. So now it can take advantage of, of sheets and subatomic particles that have the ability to move in unison or in excess of the speed of, of light. There are still physical barriers and limits that govern its that govern its ability to grow. Eventually it will strike those limits. And yeah, where are we as humans at that point? That's an evolutionary question that is actually independent of the AI because we are far more likely as humans to end our species through our own poor choices of evolution than we are by creating an AI that goes Terminator on us and, and necessitates us sending John Connor back in time. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. We um, put ourselves in our own danger in many cases. Um, so we're not even waiting for the AI. <laughs> um, you mentioned quantum computing. How soon do you think that is to, to become more available? And I know it's going to create a huge paradigm shift for NLP, natural language processing, because I think um, yeah, it'll just become very... I don't know those researchers effective. well enough. I don't know those researchers well enough. People used to ask me when I... When I uh, practice in small towns to give them to give them prognoses. Doc, what's going to happen to me? Doc, yeah, how long am I going to live? Uh, Doc, is this the disease that's going to kill me? And I would I told them all the same thing. And I used to carry a picture of myself at, at medical school graduation. And I told them, you know, I'm the only one without the crystal ball because I dropped it. <laughs> and I I think that there I, I I don't think that I could give you a realistic timeline. For quantum computing, I think that we will absolutely see it probably in your lifetime. I'm I'm just a few years older than you, possibly in mine. Will it be paradigm shifting? I I, I stray away from that term only because I've lived through so many paradigm shifts. And we call them paradigm shifts at the moment. And then and then looking back, and one of my favorite things about the pandemic, and I do have a few things that I enjoy about this pandemic. One of them is that, that the TV show Law and Order has been in perpetual rerun. And I can look back to pre 9-11 law enforcement as modeled by, by Law and Order, and I can look at how they did things, pagers, cell phones, warrants, uh, you know, eavesdropping. And then I can watch it progress past 9-11, the big paradigm shift in Homeland Security. And I have a Homeland Security badge right here that I'm a founding Homeland Security member. And I remember us all saying, this is a paradigm shift. And then you watch law and order progress for a few more years, not such a big paradigm shift. The biggest paradigm shift on law and order is to watch the phones change till they get, when they get there, when they finally get smartphones. That was the biggest change for them and it actually having been involved in security and law enforcement at the time, it was one of the biggest changes for us, was we no longer were relying on walkie talkies and a pocket full of quarters. We were able to have these other types of constant communications and even eventually, wow, take pictures ourselves and not wait for, a, not wait for crime lab to take the official ones. These were, these were things that paradigm shifts tend to be small at the time and big in retrospect because they change society. I don't know that quantum computers will fall to that. I do believe, however, that when an AI can read my child a bedtime story and my child turns to it and says, I love you, Sophia, and means it. And Sophia can turn around and say, I love you too, and make everyone in the room believe it or possibly even mean it, that will be a paradigm shift. That will be evolutionary. Wow. Yeah, I know there are lots of science fiction 
movies, shows about this, and I'm sure that we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, as we go into this decentralized future, really. Um, I do have a final question that I think you will enjoy answering is, uh, what are your thoughts on the singularity that is supposed to happen by 2045, according to Ray Kurzweil? So the kind of um, consolidation of humans and AI and brought all together. I think that I think you and I have actually been talking about it for the last hour. Healthcare will eventually become a partnership between a patient, a provider, and a highly intelligent, highly well-informed AI. They will function as a symbiotic unit for the best possible outcome of that patient. Yes, facilitated and at some time, sometimes salvaged by the human provider and certainly informed by an AI that has access to the majority, if not all of the world's healthcare information. And I think at that point, at least in medicine, we will see a singularity, maybe not Kurzweiler's view of singularity, but certainly a singularity that will benefit society as a whole and individual patients as, as people. And I actually hope that I get to live long enough to see it. Quite honestly, as a little secret, I hope since I've already helped create one medical specialty that I live long enough to serve on the board of whatever medical specialty certifies the first AI. I hope so too. And I think that um, you would really contribute a lot to it. So I'm, I'm rooting for that. Um, you know, you bring up a really good point and I start thinking about the idea of consciousness as well. And there's actually, this is a great time to mention a different singularity uh, decentralized OS series for consciousness, decentralized consciousness by Gabriel Axel. So I recommend people listening to this should also listen to that uh, episode. Really interesting, fascinating stuff about the evolution of our consciousness and digital consciousnesses. So I recommend you all, you know, tune into that. Um, with that, Dr. Ramirez, I really appreciate your time here. And I think the audience does as well. So thank you again so much. This has been really fascinating. We talked about a lot of different ways that precision medicine is going to evolve, crises medicine in your experience, COVID-19. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Rhett. It's been a pleasure. And everyone listening, just another reminder, please subscribe to the Singularity Net uh, YouTube channel, Twitter, and other social media connections. And also subscribe to my uh, podcast, Health Unchained, if you're interested in this sort of thing. And with that, good night, good morning, everybody, and take care. Music